Good evening, class. I had to, sorry for the slight delay. I had to get my computer set up so you could hear me. We're going to jump into chapter six. We're going to talk about ethical, moral, and responsible leadership. And to me, at least from a practical sense, maybe from an academic sense, uh, it, everything that they've written in this chapter six makes a lot of sense. Just like a lot of the concepts that um, you, you, you talked about in chapter five, where it was talking about situational leadership, from an academic perspective, a lot of it makes sense. It's just when you get into the operational side of the house and you actually become a leader and try to implement um, some of these concepts, it's not hardly as straightforward and definitely not as easy as the text makes it sound. But again, from, from my perspective, and I think a lot of it is driven by perception, when we, when we get into ethical and moral debates, it's, it's extremely difficult for leaders. Um, they're, you know, leaders in, in most organizations are pulled and it seems like in a thousand different directions and making snap decisions, especially on a daily basis. And sometimes they get caught up in things that they probably shouldn't get caught up in. But again, it's, it's perception that, that drives this ethical, moral I guess maybe I hate to call it a dilemma, but let's call it the issues that we're going to talk about in chapter six. But first, let's go back and review a couple of things that we talked about in chapter five. And I think we, we still need to go back and it was either chapter one or chapter two where they talked about effective leadership and it you know talked about the uh, integration or intertwining or uh, whatever terminology you want to use among leader follower and context. And to me, context is, is just of those three, it, it is one of the main drivers because as you you will find, or maybe you've already found, if if you're um, an individual in this class, taking this class, since it is a graduate class, you may already be out in the workforce and maybe already starting up that corporate leadership ladder. And it's it's just, it's sometimes really difficult as a leader, to tie all these concepts together. But under situational leadership, if you remember in chapter five, they talked about inflexible versus flexible. Inflexible, you had kind of the, the two dichotomies, I guess. You had the comfortable leader, and then you had the task-oriented directive leader. And to me, that definitely is driven by context. What context fits um, also, the characteristics of the leader are going to have a huge impact on which one of those types, or or maybe they're somewhat, maybe you're somewhere in between. I've always felt like I kind of fell. I was one of these hybrid leaders that kind of fell somewhere in between, and would lean one way or the other, depending on what the context or what the demands of the of the current at that point, whatever the current task were before me. Uh, on the flexible side. They, they go into the, the three, I'll call them models. Uh, you had the path goal. It would seem to be more flexible. It, to me, it's more day-to-day, -day, more operational, day-to-day uh, -day activities, those type things. Whereas uh, the Hersey uh, Blanchard and the, and the Room Jago, they were more decision-making processes. Uh, and again, path goal, followers need leadership style, you know, the effect on the followers, you know, trying to tie all that together in a day-to-day -day concept. On that Hersey Blanchard, you had the little triangle, um, that kind of like a, a doorstop that, um, or actually really a right triangle, but a doorstop that you see some people, lots wooden doorstops, you know, to hold doors open. And it, it was the process of, of decision-making and how the control evolved as you went across a continuum. And up when it was the leader control, you were more uh, directive, consultative, and then they called it that demarcation of control. And that's a point where as a leader, you feel yourself maybe, I don't say losing control, but shifting more control to your followers. And when you get down on the end where it had follower control, it was like facilitative and, and delegative. And 
again, it to me, it, it depends on the context. It depends on the skill set of your followers. It depends on how much time you have. If it's a snap judgment, you know, something needs to be done, you know, spur of the moment, maybe it needs to be done over the weekend. You may, as a, as a leader, be more up in this directive uh, sphere of, of this right triangle. Uh, and if you're trying to groom people to be leaders and you've got plenty of time, like building strategies and things, maybe that's where you're, where you're down in that delegative side. Uh, and on that Hershey Blanchard, it, it had four levels. Uh, based on the leaders, you know, your followers or your leader's perception of your followers' readiness. And I actually like those four le those four levels. So, um, I'm, I, you know, I might keep those four levels in my back pocket. And then we jumped on down to that room, Jago, and, uh, you know, it was, that was that decision tree. And to me, some questions, and I think they even talked about it in the textbook, some questions had more weight than others, more importance than others. Um, to me, a lot of that decision tree, while it made sense, especially in an academic setting uh, where you're doing some research and doing surveys and, you know, playing around in the sandbox, how much of it that, you know, that I personally, given the leadership opportunities that I've had, how much of that could I personally impact or or utilize in a in, you know in, in daily decision making processes? Uh, it's it, it, then if you looked at those questions, uh, it, it talked about the significance of the problem, the leader's expertise, the commitment of the followers, and that to me that one huge, and the followers' ability to work as a team. So of those four things, or those four concepts, or four parameters. I've never had as much trouble getting them to work as a team because <clears throat> I guess I've been blessed that I always had some followers that were strong enough leaders, especially if you delegate it, that they can bring everybody together and, and move them forward as a team. And they they kind of tie, try to tie it all together down toward the tail end of chapter five, talking about situational leadership perspective. Uh, and it, you know, they thought it was based on uh, leader flexibility, uh, differences in perception, and finally limited scope. So actually, it was, to me, it was an interesting chapter, uh, again, from, a, from an academic research type perspective. Some of the concepts I probably implemented using, you know, different terminology in the past. So some will work, some may not work. Um, but definitely in chapter five, there's some ideas that that I think you might want to take back and, you know, kind of kick the tires on. You know, then they may work for your, if you're a leader uh, in your particular situation now, maybe some of them work. And if they don't work, maybe they work somewhere down the road. It's just, again, it's you're you're trying to develop everything and apply it within that certain context. Now we're going to jump into the kind of the meat and potatoes of chapter six. And we're talking about ethical, moral, and responsible leadership. And that's where the, the authors, that the, they really love these acronyms. So uh, they talk about an ethical and moral leadership. And that acronym is EML. Uh, they, you know, the three parameters or the three um, attributes, let's call them, talk about confidence, corporate image, and brand. Um, and to me, it's the corporate, at least in the in the organizations where I've worked in the past, it's not so much confidence as it is the corporate image and the brand, especially if you work in a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. Brand is 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 especially important. And that corporate image in the community is especially important. So it depends on what kind of uh, organization you work for. Uh, that's going to actually drive which of those three attributes are most important. But um, I think you'll find as you kind of go through this chapter, I think they're all important in different ways. And research, again, guys that wrote the textbook or you know, they're research guys, so they're constantly doing research. Stronger ethical moral compass outperforms the competition. And I think there is some truth to that. Um, if you work for a, for an organization that has a reputation of being um, unethical and immoral and not really responsible, not only to the clients and the customer base, but even to their internal employees, 
I think it's an organization that's going to have difficulty making it, especially in the workforce today. And where we talk about, when they were talking about the, the stronger ethical and moral compass, they were talking about organizational climate, stressing what they call procedural justice. And the term by the definition they actually give you is the establishment of fairness and consistency in how employees are treated. Seems pretty much common sense to me. I, you know, I don't know what you thought of that definition, but I, you know, it's long. I mean, we've always been at least taught, I guess is maybe the right word, that you want to treat everybody fairly. Uh, decision-making, free of biases, favoritism, and personal interest, and top-level leaders establish and reinforce the climates. And here's where, to me, it starts, the perception starts leaking in. And I'll give you an example. So I'd been at, at Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'd already been there probably five or six years and had an um, opening for a manager on the medical economics team that I had that previous manager had decided to, to move on to greener pastures and so had a manager position open and and had several internal candidates, had a multitude of external candidates, but I ended up selecting um, a young lady to, to lead that medical, in, you know, informatics and medical economics team, extremely talented, fantastic coder and programmer, understood healthcare, and she just just without a doubt, and I had HR set in on some of the interviews. And again, it goes back to some of the earlier chapters where you're talking about, you know, does she fit the team and some things like that. But, but again, just just an exceptional individual. I had my direct supervisor, uh, who's one of the senior VPs, interviewer too, and he said, you know, slam dunk, you know, no no doubt. Well, I made her the offer, hired her, got her in place. Three or four months down the road. Um, I received a phone call from HR and legal. And one of my other employees who had applied for the position had filed a grievance uh, with the perception being uh, I developed the job description and developed the uh, position specifically for her in mind, basically saying the position was wired for this individual to come in and take it, which it was just it was ludicrous that anybody would have thought that. And so I went down, talked to HR, talked to uh, the legal team that, you know, we're, we're trying to manage this. They'd come in through the fraud hotline, I guess, is what had happened. So, and so back and forth, back and forth, talked to the senior VP. He went down, talked to them, and they eventually uh, closed it out with no finding. But but those are the kind of things, again, it goes back to the perception. It was a fair and equitable hiring process, but one disgruntled individual who had wanted the position was not qualified in any form or fashion, but had filed a complaint and not only take up my time, but it took up HR's time, it took up legal's time. They were dragging other people in to talk to them that had set in on the interview. So <clears throat> again, uh, perception, even though you're trying to do everything right, just always be careful about perception. And then they they launch into the EML leaders. They're, they're there. They're setting policy. They're making strategic decisions. They're leading by example. And that's what they, the text, the authors in the text think this EML leadership type um, of individual is establishing this ethical climate. And that's at the leader level. Now, if you're if you're looking down, and and we'll get into some more of it later on in the text. But they talk about the EL the EML managers. They and they call them lower level. So um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how they define lower level in the text. Uh, typically, <clears throat> I think of of leaders. In most organizations where I've worked, is director and above, um, and it's kind of it's it you know you've got you've got you call them the C-suite, and then you may have some uh, senior leadership, but and and the directors are are kind of the lower bound, let's call it that senior leadership. So they're part of the senior leadership team, 
definitely not, you know, the pull and the cloud and, and the responsibilities as a senior VP um, or a VP, but still a lot of responsibilities in all the organizations that I've worked for. But anyway, they talk about you know, EML managers, you know, quote, lower level, and they are responsible for setting examples, enforcing the ethical standards, acting in an open and truthful manner, and avoiding abrasive, abrasive behavior. Again, sounds operationally, um, sounds pretty straightforward. And there is, so you've got the leaders that are establishing the ethical climate, and it's the lower level managers that are reflecting this ethical climate. And at that point, I'm going to kind of kind of stop because I want to spend some time uh, getting more into the, the EML P7. I don't want these videos to run too long. So I will be back in a few minutes and we'll talk about uh, the overview of, of EML. Talk to you soon.